Hope everybody's doing well this evening. Welcome to everybody. Hope that there'll be some joining us here in just a few minutes. Hope everybody's had a fantastic week. Hello, Sister Ponta. Hated to uh, get the news of Brother Frizzell's passing. I know that's been tough on you and the family, so you just keep trusting God and uh, praying for Sister Frizzell. I know that uh, I'm sure you have been, but uh, God bless you. How are the Larsons? Hope y'all are doing well. The Mahoney's, good to see you guys. The Watsons. Wave back to you, Sister Lamanda. We'll be starting here in a, a few minutes. Hope everybody's had a, a fantastic week. Hope everything's going well for you. Saw a heart and a thumbs up, so somebody's had a good one. <laughs> We've got about 15 uh, people on right now, so I think a few more are coming. Hey there. Pam, yes, sir, Sister Judy, God bless you. God bless you. Brother Larson had his uh, next to the last chemo today. One more to go, Brother Larson. You're going to have this thing behind you. Hello to you, Sister Lamanda. We've got another minute or so here before we'll start. Hope that you've got a little strength tonight, Brother Larson. After your treatment, I think usually you do pretty good with God's help. Renee Jackson. Hello, Sister Nene. Joel Muro. Jameis Pate. Come on, Brother Jameis. I guess that's Brother Jamie to everybody else. But the McManna. Wave to the McManna. Hello there, Mindy McManus. Renee Jackson, the Kennedys, there they are. How are my friends? Kiddos, y'all better be doing good tonight now. Every single one of you, even you, Ivy, Michael, Addie, Emma, y'all be good. Sister Nicole Bell, Melissa Ivy, good to see you. Mindy was waving back. Sister Vicki Terry is watching. Hey, Sister Vicki, thanks for the wave. Savannah Sullivan, hey, everybody. Hey, hey to you, sister. Sister Florian Brown, I hope that uh, Brother Daryl's feeling better. Hello, Amber. Hope you and the fam are great. Just working all the time. All work and no play makes Melissa a dull girl. Now, come on, Sister Melissa. <laughs> well, it's a few minutes. I've, actually, it's probably about one minute after. <clears throat> So we'll, uh, we'll get uh, started here in just, a, just a, uh, maybe another minute, give a few more people a chance to join that may be coming in. Sister Knight, hello there. God bless you. God bless you, Sister Knight. But uh, got, a, got a good weekend coming up. I think you're going to enjoy what's in store for this coming Sunday. Appreciate everybody joining us tonight. We're still in the series on uh, the problem of God. And uh, this has been uh, just a great series from my perspective, but it's the problem of God. I know that's backwards uh, to you guys as you look at it, but the name is Mark Clark, the problem of God. And so tonight we're going to be diving into chapter eight, chapter eight, uh, and we're going to be talking about hypocrisy, hypocrisy. Now, hopefully that don't make anybody real nervous. Hey, there's the Baines. Hello to y'all. Lynn Ashby Knight. Great to see everybody join us here tonight. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Let's just ask God to be with us tonight, to guide our thoughts, open our hearts and our minds, and uh, let's learn and grow together. God, I thank you for this night. Thank you for each person that's joined us online tonight. We just pray, God, that you bless this time together, that, uh, God, something is said, that you allow something to settle into our spirit that makes us a better person, more like you, and a better reflection of our world that you are indeed alive, real, and on the throne. We just pray that you're glorified tonight and everybody that's watching is edified. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. 
So uh, we're going to start here in chapter 8. Now, we've had some um, pretty, pretty intensive uh, discussions these last couple of weeks, so uh, this may be a little bit of a you can actually exhale. I think following up after sex and hail uh, hypocrisy may, may <laughs> feel a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess, easy, easy on us, but, uh, but I think we've got something to learn yet even tonight. So we're going to start and uh, just look at the definition of hypocrisy before we actually dive into this chapter. Um, hey, Brother Bill, uh, hypocrisy, as dictionary.com would say it, is a pretense of having a virtuous character. So it's acting like you have a virtuous character, moral or religious beliefs or principles, and then you don't really possess them. So it's acting like that you are somebody that you're actually not. So an hypocrite would be a person who pretends to have virtues morale or religious beliefs, principles, etc., that he or she does not actually possess, especially a person whose actions belie their stated beliefs, a person who feigns some desirable or public, publicly approved uh, attitude, especially one whose private life opinions or statements belie his or her public statements. So it's, it's pretending to be something that you're not. It's pretending to be uh, in, in, in our world, it's pretending to be like Jesus Christ, pretending to be a Christian when in fact your life is not reflective, your heart is not reflective of that belief that you're professing. So let's kind of get started here. He, he give an interesting, hey, Brother Austin, Brother John, he give an interesting uh, reflection on a study in 2007 by the Barna Group. And it said the Barna Group did an extensive uh, research project. Again, we're in chapter eight, uh, research project in which they asked non-Christian people why they rejected Christianity. So they asked non-Christians, why is it that you don't believe in Christianity? Why are you rejecting Christianity? Many, many Christian leaders were surprised to learn that none of the top answers were evidential. It wasn't because we didn't, you couldn't prove to me that it didn't exist. They rejected Christianity for more, more moralistic reasons. So for morals, for the reasons of, of the way we behave, the top three problems people had with Christianity were they viewed it as, number one, the first problem they had, they viewed it as anti-homosexual. 91% of the respondents said that uh, that's the, the main reason or that was the, the reason why they wouldn't want to follow Christianity because uh, of their, their view of anti-homosexual. The second uh, reason was they were judgmental, that the church was judgmental. There was 87% that selected that answer. And then, believe it or not, the third reason that high up the chart was hypocritical, that the church was hypocritical. 85% of the respondents said that they felt like the church was hypocritical. In other words, that people in the church were professing one thing, but they were living yet another. And so, Modern people contend that the greatest proof that God doesn't exist, and get this, we're trying to, to figure out the problem with God and how people contend that God is not real, and they're using the hypocrisy of Christians to, to refute that God exists. So that's a problem that we have to address. See, modern people contend that the greatest proof that God doesn't exist is the behavior of Christians themselves. In short, the way Christians live and act is solid proof to them in their minds that what Christians believe is not true. So the way that we live as Christians, if, it's, if it doesn't align, if our lifestyle doesn't align with, our, with what we profess, then it gives them a reason, it gives the, the, the non-Christians a reason to say Christianity is not real. If it was real, then they would do what they say they believe. So when we, when, we're, when we live a hypocritical life, we're actually giving fodder, we're giving them opportunity to say that God does not exist. And so if, if you, sure, let's face it, there's lots of problems with Christianity when we come to people because there's lots of problems with people. And the church is made up of people. The Christian church, Christianity, is made up of human beings. And anywhere you have a human being, guess what you're going to have? You're going to have the potential for hypocrisy. It's, it's going to exist because uh, you have people that, that 
uh, are real and you have people that are not real. That's just, that, that's true wherever you go, wherever you live, wherever you and whatever age you exist in. Hey, if you look over the history of the world, the history of our nation, the history of your life, <laughs> what we've witnessed in our short lifespan, the horrific acts, horrific acts have been committed in the name of Christ. Christians should not take the challenge of these injustices uh, naively. We, we can't act like that the church or people that claim to be Christians haven't hurt people. Let's face it, people are probably wounded every single week somewhere in a local church. That people are, are hurt, there, there's bad things that happen. That's unfortunate, but wherever you got people that gathered, you have the potential for pain and for hurt and, and for, for, for acts of unkindness and, and, and wrong acts and painful acts. It, it, it's just, that's, the, that's unfortunately the nature of our world. And we can't act like that's not happening. We can't say, although the church is perfect, or, well, well, maybe the church, but everybody that claims to be a Christian is not perfect. And, and everybody that professes to be even a part of a particular church organization, they're not perfect. And, and some of them actually are not Christians. They're just simply not Christians. As Christians, we need to take responsibility for Christians. For, I'm sorry, I was reading there. As Christians, we need to take responsibility for institutions that carry the name of Jesus. If there's a church, what we can, a Christian church is doing something really stupid, we don't have to defend them. If there's somebody in our church that's doing something really stupid, we don't have to defend them. If they're doing something that's wrong, if they're doing something that's against the Bible, just because they call themselves a Christian, we shouldn't have to feel like we have to run to their defense. They're human beings that claim to be Christians that are not living a Christian lifestyle. And we need to be able to say that that's, call it, call it what it is. They're, they are hypocrites. They're, non, they're non-Christians, even though they're professing Christianity, but we also need to clarify that these institutions do not always represent Jesus or reflect what he taught. We can't defend what they're doing, but what we can say is, listen, this person, this institution, this group of people, they may call themselves Christians, but they're not living out what Christ taught. So what we have to do is be able to point people back to Jesus if we ever get our, our, our focus on people, our focus on groups of people, on, on uh, name brands, if we ever start getting our focus off of Jesus Christ, then you are setting yourself up for failure and the world is setting themselves up for disappointment in Christianity because humans are subject to failure. We've discovered that our entire life. And so what we have to understand is, is we have to point people back to Jesus Christ Himself, And we need to reflect on what he lived and what he taught. You see, the church is filled with people who aren't actually Christians. So don't judge Christianity by the morality of the people who try to follow it, but focus on Jesus, his life, his teachings, his actions. Some who claim to follow Christ, get this, they don't actually know him or follow him. You realize that? There are people out there that confess to be Christians. You probably work with them every day. You may even go to church with some of them, unfortunately. But they claim to be Christians. But you can look at their lifestyle. And you know that their lifestyle is not in alignment with what Christ taught or how Christ lived. And as Christians, we are followers of Christ. So we're supposed to be emulating Christ. That's who we're supposed to be patterning our life after. The, 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 the letters to the churches and what Christ lived and taught, this is how we pattern our life. So if someone's not patterning their life after Jesus Christ, then guess what? They're not. They're not a Christian. Now, unfortunately, many of them still title themselves Christian. And we say, well, that hurts us all. Well, that's absolutely true. But we, we can't let those who are, who are not real Christians come to define us as Christians. That's just like you, you may have some bad engineers out there. You may have some bad uh, lawyers. You may have some bad doctors. But at the end of the day, the, the ones that are real, the ones that are fighting for truth and for justice, they, they, can't, they can't throw in the towel because they've got some bad ones. No, you've got to let your light shine bright as a true Christian. We've got to emulate Jesus Christ and we've got to let him shine through us and, and realize that there's always going to be tears that grow with the wheat. The, the Bible made that very clear in, in when he was teaching those parables that you're going to have wheat and tear that grow together. So we can't be disillusioned by the tear. Now, here's the point this book is making. The world looks at those tares, 
the people that aren't real, and it gives him a reason to justify that God doesn't exist. So what we as real Christians have to do is we have to overcompensate. We've got to make sure we shine the light of Jesus Christ and we live it out. And the power of God is, is prevalent in our lives so that they can't deny the reality of God. And that's what our responsibility, that's what our call should be, to live in such a way that people cannot deny that Jesus Christ is real and that God is on the throne. And if we live in that way, then we're going to have an opportunity to affect and to influence our world. Now, knowing and realizing that, that everybody is not a Christian, I, I want to give you an example of how bad this is, of, of how the world sees sees the church. I'm going to read a little bit here uh, from, from page 185. It says, for instance, several years ago, a poll was taken that showed that the lifestyle activities of Christians, now get this, is sad, were statistically the same as those of people claiming not to be Christians when it came to the following list. Now, you, I want you to grasp this list. And it said that the poll showed that there was little difference between Christians and non-Christians, which is, this is going to be a shame for uh, probably stunning, hopefully, for some of you. So this is the list. Gambling, visiting pornographic websites, taking something that didn't belong to them, saying mean things behind someone's back, uh-oh, consulting a median or a psychic, having a physical fight or abusing someone, that, I mean, the poll says that there was not much difference between Christians and non-Christians in all these areas. Using illegal or non-prescription drugs. Saying something to someone that's not true. Getting back at someone for something they did and consuming enough alcohol to be considered legally drunk. These are all things that they said the poll revealed that there was not much difference in the lifestyle of Christians or non-Christians. And that should be concerning to all of us, there was no statistical difference, it says, between a Christian and a non-Christian in these 10 areas of their lives. That should be alarming. But it lets us know that we have people in the church that, that A, may not have come to know him yet, B, maybe they're on their journey to Christ, or C, they're not at church because they're following Jesus. They're at church because of, of, an, of a myriad of other reasons. It could be relational, it could be... Uh, a, a myriad of reasons, political, could be anything that reason people attend church. We can't assume that everybody that walks in our doors is a Christian reflecting Jesus Christ. This exemplifies what people mean when they say Christians are hypocrites. They see people who claim to be morally upright, yet look, sound, act, and live no different than anyone else in the world. Man, why, is, why does this put so much emphasis on us as apostolics, that those are called out to, to be separate, to be different from the world. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. According to the Bible, though, though if, is there, if there is no outward change in behavior, allegiances, loves, and passions, Jesus would question whether these people are actually Christians at all. Here, here's the problem. The problem, though, is that their lives may misrepresent Christianity to the world. It's bad enough that if they're living that lifestyle, that they're in, their soul is in peril, but now what they're doing is they're sending a terrible message to the world around them. So if that's anybody watching tonight, if you're living a, a professing Christianity but living a life that's the, the same as every other non-Christian out there, then all you're doing is being a, a, been a negative reflection on the church. You're being a negative reflection on Christianity, and you're, you're probably causing people not to want what you have. That's why our relationship and our witness is so important. Why is it important that we, we, that we are righteous people, that we are holy people, that we are people that, that walk in, in the Spirit and, and they walk in the Word? Why is it so important? Why do we emphasize that? It's because some people are only going to, to know and sense and hear Jesus through us. They weren't raised maybe this way. And so when they see a Christian, they're probably either looking to say, okay, is this real or is this not real? And when they look at you, when they look at you, when they look at me, are they going to be able to say that, man, Christianity must be real? Christianity must, there must be something to this because this person is not like the rest of the world. This person's different. 
This person has a different attitude than those. This person goes through storms differently. This person faces adversity in a different way. This person has a hope when, when all hope is lost. This person has love when he has every reason to hate. This person does not fear, even though there's the circumstances around him would call for fear. This person is resilient in the face of adversity. And, and, and if we can live a lifestyle like that, we're going to be living a lifestyle that not only recommends God, but that people are actually going to want to emulate. Everybody out there, if they were going to be honest with themselves, they're going to want a life of peace. They're going to want a life of hope. They're going to want a life of love. And so if somehow we can emulate that and be true Christians, then we can, we can pull people toward God. On the flip side of that, if we decide that we're not going to, that we're going to be like the rest of the world, yeah, we're going to tell everybody how great God is. And man, he's, he's, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian and, and I believe in God and he blesses me. And then they see the way you live and they see how you face hardship. They see the way you go through frustration. And then how do you anticipate or expect them to gravitate toward you, toward your church, toward your faith? if you're no different than the, everybody else that's around them. So there's a reason why the, the Bible called us out to be separate, to be identifiable as Christians, to be set apart, to be holy, to be righteous people. So let me find where I'm at in my notes here. <clears throat> so it says, uh, our first question needs to be this. We don't need to be looking at other people. We don't need to be looking at Christians, the world. If, if somebody comes to you and they're arguing the existence of God is not real because they know too many hypocrites. I've seen people in the church, so they're denying that God exists because they witness hypocrites. Here, here's our first question is what did Jesus teach? What did Jesus teach? And then secondly, how did Jesus live? If we can ask those two questions, how did Je what did Jesus teach and how did Jesus live, we have to point people to Jesus. They will always have an opportunity to look at a, at a non-Christian that calls himself a Christian and debunk the faith. If they get their eyes again on humanity, they're always going to find a spot for failure. But if we can point them toward Jesus, we can say look above the people that, that are calling themselves Christians or even Christians that, are, that, are, that, are, that have failures. I mean, come on, we're all in this flesh. None of us has, have arrived in heaven yet. We're all subject to having that moment that we all regret and we, we repent for and we apologize for. But we don't want people making their call on whether God is real or not on that moment. We want people looking to Jesus Christ. We want them looking to how Jesus lived. I mean, the, people look at individuals. But even you may get into a discussion with someone talking about is Christ real because we're talking about stuff like gambling and stuff of that nature. They're going to probably throw up to you. How about the Crusades? Wasn't it Christians that killed thousands of people during the Crusades? And, and the truth be told that the Crusades under the name of Christians killed lots and lots of people. But here's what we have to understand is those Crusades weren't tent revivals. <laughs> those Crusades weren't uh, uh, door knocking for evangelism. Uh, and, and he writes in the book, many of these fights were political and nationalistic battles. They're, they're not religious battles. This was not about the advancement of the kingdom of God and the heartfelt conversion of people to Jesus, but the expansion of European rule. It was draped in a vaguely Christian exoskeleton. So it, it was about a, a theocracy. It was about taking over, taking space. It was politically driven. And it wasn't about saving souls. And so, yes, it, it was cruel. It was about the expansion of European rule and draped in, in Christianity. And in many cases, the, the Christians were actually fighting defensively. They were to protect themselves from, from invading Muslim attacks or, or, or to reclaim land that had been lost to the Muslim invaders. But nevertheless, nevertheless, people will point to that and say, hey, look at all these supposedly Christians in the world. So, so we, we got to be ready to say, hey, listen, th 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 those people weren't reflecting Jesus Christ. That wasn't a reflection of Jesus Christ. That wasn't a reflection of Jesus Christ's teaching. Here's the deal. Now, if, if they want to bring the Crusades into the question, if you're talking with a, someone that's, that's trying to question God based on the cruelty of Christians throughout the years, let's look at the, at the whole vast humanity. 
Let's not just isolate it on Christians. Let's look at the cruelty of humans in general. See, if, if we look at the past hundred years, the most violent and horrific regimes humankind has seen have been atheistic. You understand that? They can point to the Crusades and say, man, look at the cruelty of the Christians. But, but, but how, about, how about those that have been atheistic and not religious? Look at Joseph Stalin's Russia. I mean, that's a, there's a lot of cruelty there. Mao's China. The, the, the Khmer Road in Cambodia. And of course, Adolf Hitler's uh, final solution in Europe. They were all driven by communist, Marxist, and atheistic philosophies. So why don't we talk about those? That they rejected organized religion and God as a central tenet of their system of belief. In other words, secular, non-religious worldviews created the context for some of the most horrific violence that the world has ever seen. Hitler, get this, Hitler killed six million Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals, etc. Killed six million people. He, he was responsible for the death of six million people. The Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia killed two million of their own people. Two million of their own people. Stalin killed 20, 20 million. Now, Hitler was six million. The, the Cambodian rogue was two million. Stalin killed 20 million through mass slayings and labor camps. And then Mao in China, he exterminated an estimated 50 to 70 million of his own people. These were all atheistic. They were non-religious. They were anti-Christ, for lack of a better word. So altogether, these non-religious non convictions killed 100 million people in 100 years. Just those, just those four regimes killed 100 million people in 100 years. Now you contrast that with the so-called Christian conflicts throughout history that we've noted previously. They killed about 200,000 people over the course of 500 years. Do you see a difference there? They killed, the Christian conflicts killed about 200,000 people, which is terrible. We can't justify that. And, and we give reason for that earlier. We, we're not justifying that. It was, it was in a religious struggle. It was a political battle. But nevertheless, they killed, in the name of Christianity, killed 200,000 200, people over 500 years. But those other four regimes killed 100 million people in just 100 years. History has proven that adopting a philosophy wherein the answer to violence and oppression is less religion, it's a failure. They can't pretend that, that Christianity is the one that's brought all this uh, death when the, the sheer data, the numbers show that that is just absolutely not, it's not the case. And so, so let's look. If, if you look... Let me, let, me, let, me, let me pause there and let me say this. Evaluating whether, I'm sorry, we should examine the worldviews of Christianity. Here's, what I want, here's my point with that, sorry. Got mixed up in my notes. We should examine the worldviews of Christianity and atheism to see which avoids the injustices that we all abhor. And we've seen where millions upon millions got killed by the atheistic agenda and, and several hundred, a couple of hundred thousand by the Christian uh, regimes. So we should, we should examine the worldviews of both of these on which one avoids the injustices that we all abhor. There, there are certain things that, that as human beings we just abhor. We say there's an injustice there. Now, which one of these, the Christians or the atheistic uh, regimes, have fought against these, have fought for justice? Uh, on this count, Christianity succeeds where atheism fails. W one of the big things, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to it, uh, looking at the time up there, I'm going to point to it real quick. Uh, I, I know I'm running quickly out of time here. There's so much information. I'm just telling you, you can't fully appreciate how we're trying to condense these chapters into a 30-minute lesson. There is so much information in this book. Uh, you're going to do yourself a favor by, by reading the book. Uh, don't just say, well, I'm going to listen and I'll, I'll ingest the book this way. I'm skimming. I'm, I'm just taking certain parts of this. You owe it to yourself uh, to, to get a copy of this book, The Problem of God. There, there may be some left in the bookstore. If not, you can get it on Amazon. But we're talking about, okay, what are these cultures, what, what, what injustices do they stand for? What change have they really made in the world for goodness sake, to, to make the world a better place? For instance, a majority of cultures throughout history have had slaves. And this is pretty relative to, to the topic of discussion in our world today. But the majority of cultures throughout history have had slaves. Now, that's, that's sad. 
But it's just history. It's the fact. It was Christianity that came along and called it out as wrong and said every human being is made in the image of God. That slavery, whether good for the market or not, should be abolished. It was Christianity that did that. It wasn't atheism that did that. It was not a secular Darwinist who fought against slavery in the British Empire, but a Christian, William Wilberforce. He basically gave his life to end slavery. It was Christians that fought on the behalf of abolishment of slavery. It wasn't some atheistic society. It wasn't some atheistic communist Marxist regime. It wasn't that. It was Christians that said, no more. We can't, we can't do this anymore. We can't have this. It was Christians that stood up for what's right. So, so you look at all the regimes through history. Which one has impacted and affected positive change in the world? Has it been those that are godless? Or is it has, has it been the Christian community that stood up for truth, that stood up for what is right? So don't come to me as a non-believer, as, as a doubter of God, and try to look back on our history and say Christians have been cruel. There's been a lot of people, unfortunately, that have been cruel in the name of Christianity. And for that, I'm so sorry. I wish that never happened because it's a, it's a blight on, on what Christianity should really be. It's not a true reflection of who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm sorry that those events happened. I'm sorry that that happened. But, but we can't judge. We can't judge it on that merit. We can't look at those who did it wrong because people did, every, did wrong from every walk of life. People have killed people from every walk of life. More we've obviously seen in this historical report, a lot more from the atheistic vantage point than from the Christian vantage point. So here's what I want to challenge you. Evaluating Christi whether Christianity or, or any other idea or hypothesis is true, it's got to be based on research and data, not whether a particular adherents succeed or fail in living it out. If you get your eyes on a human being and say, okay, the, the, if, if he can make it, if, he, if he's real, then I'm going to believe that Christianity is real. You can't do that. You can't do that. The world can't do that. We can't do that as Christians. We have to go back, as we've stated already two or three times, and say, okay, are we emulating the life and teaching of Jesus Christ? Are we emulating the life and teaching of Jesus Christ? And if you are as a Christian, then hopefully you, are, you should be drawing people to you. Drawing people, more importantly to you, but drawing people to Jesus. We can just be a conduit through which Jesus flows to reach people, the love of Christ. If we will simply show love to our world, do you realize how countercultural that's going to be? In a world that I don't know that I've ever seen it any more divisive than it is right now. I mean, the, the, they're, everything from politics to sports to, to to, I mean, they're trying to divide us uh, by race. They're trying to divide us uh, every, every way they can, socioeconomically. They're trying to divide us from an educational standpoint. They're trying to divide uh, from, from, uh, from uh, the ladies against the men and the young against the old. They're, they're just trying to divide us. But what if, what if we actually followed Jesus Christ and we just simply obeyed his teaching and we showed love to a world? We showed forgiveness. We showed peace in a storm. What if we did these simple things? Could we absolutely shine the light of Jesus Christ into a world that has to be hungry? Has to be because they've seen so much chaos. We're getting, I'm getting close to the end here. Here's the, here's the deal. At the end of everything, when we're standing before God, it'll be about what you did. It will be about what you did, not about what others did with the teaching of Jesus Christ. You can't blame it on somebody else that claimed to be a Christian that failed and that because they failed, you didn't believe in Christianity. No, it's not what it's going to be about. It's going to be what did you do with the teachings of Jesus Christ. First of all, it's going to have a great impact on your eternal destination. Second of all, it's going to have a great impact on how people see Jesus.
Both of those are vital. It's vital that you make heaven your home, but it's also vital that you share that message and that hope and that love with those people that are watching your life every day and know for sure they're watching. They're watching. The Bible calls us to judge the truth of Christianity by the life of its founder, Jesus Christ. Not by the lives of those attempting to follow him. It's because in Jesus, in him, you will find someone worthy of trust and in imitation. If we will simply imitate Jesus Christ, show him and reflect him to the world, then we're going to have an opportunity for us to make heaven and hopefully take a lot more people there with us. So I'm asking us, as the Gullitzville Pentecostal Church, and I've seen some, several other names of those who aren't uh, necessarily don't, the, this is not their church home, even though they're probably connected to us. Why don't we reflect Jesus? Sure, you're allowed to have an opinion. We've all got them. We've all got political opinions. We've all got uh, our, our own ideas and, and the way that uh, we think about life and uh, I guess uh, the, the way we've been raised and brought up and what we've been exposed to. But here's the deal. All that has to go out the window when we talk about Jesus. We have to fit our life into his culture. We don't fit him into our culture, okay? We have to fit into his life he doesn't fit himself into our life. So I want us all to commit to that, that we're going to live a life that gets us to heaven and that draws people to Jesus. Let's love like never before. Let's let Goodlesville Pentecostal Church and whatever church it is that you represent out there, let's let it be a light, a beacon of hope that those who are irreligious, those who are non-Christian, can say, you know what? I don't know that I ever believed in Christianity until I met you fill in the blank. Once I met them, their life is so real and they're so true. They're not perfect, but they follow Jesus. And I think that's a person that I can align my life with. God bless you all. God bless you all. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. And thank you for the power that we possess through repentance, baptism in Jesus' name and being filled with your spirit. I pray, God, that you give us each one courage and boldness and the tenacity to live the life that you've called us to live, emulating you, imitating you, being the person that you have purposed and called us to become. And in so doing, may people see you. May we be able to connect people to you and reconcile people to you that they too can enjoy an eternity in heaven with you. God bless you all. I hope you have a great evening, a fantastic rest of the week. And hopefully we'll see you Sunday, if not in person. We're having the 930 and the 1130. Uh, but we can also, you can view us online if that's what you feel safe is doing. Hope to see everybody soon. Love you guys. God bless you. Have a fantastic week.